They even got the pick off on Bang. Rox doesn't actually have to stop pushing right now. They can delay the recalls. The arrow! The arrow! Look at the arrow! He got teleport! He got to stop! He stopped him! I think he's in the bed. Oh, Baker, maybe in trouble here, Deathmark. Tries to clean it up for Ryu. Oh, look at the cleanse! Look at the moves! Baker, what was that? The deafening cheers of tens of thousands of cheering Chinese fans have overcome every challenge. They are the undisputed best team in the world. But that will change today. The crownless are finally king. And Invictus Gaming are your 2018 world champions. With the recent world championships in 2020, League of Legends celebrated a full decade of esports competition and cemented its place yet again as one of the most popular competitive video games in the world. League's climb from just being a popular casual game to being such a massive media franchise can be largely attributed to the decisions made by Riot Games to promote its esports scene and make every experience watching the various regions matches as exciting and inspiring as possible. The shift from being a game with its biggest tournament prize pool being $100,000 to a cultural icon with prizes in the millions of dollars was no accident and League of Legends has become the gold standard for competitive esports organization between 2010 and now. But to see the way things have changed in the last decade, we're going to have to dig a little bit deeper. League's esports are divided into year-long time periods known as seasons, and this is a cutoff for both players and pros to try to gain rank as much as possible with each season capped off with the World Championships, held in a different location around the world each year. The first season began back in July of 2010, less than a year after the game's release. This quick turnaround to adding a ranked option to the game showed that Riot Games immediately saw the potential for competition in League to be a massive endeavor. The game existed in a state of flux at all times, with consistent patches, tweaks, and new releases changing the meta and allowing for new strategies to appear at any time, a characteristic that carries through even today in modern League of Legends. 28 new champions were released during the year that made up Season 1, broadening the roster in a huge way and requiring players to constantly be learning and trying new things in order to keep up with the changing game around them. Season 1 showed competitive League of Legends in its infancy, with the only way for the best players in the world to show their talent being through third-party hosted tournaments like IEM or MLG. Teams were formed from each region from the results of these third-party tournaments, and the existing regions at the time held the World's Qualifier Tournament just before the start of summer to determine which teams would be attending the World Championships that year. At this time, there were only four regions, and only eight teams would be able to compete at Worlds. So we saw three teams from North America, three teams from Europe, one team from Singapore, and one team from the Philippines rise to the top and head to DreamHack 2011 in Jankoping, Sweden to discover which of them is the best in the world. The early years of League of Legends are almost unwatchable for modern day players due to the art style changes, champion updates, and differences in the game mechanics that have happened since then, making it an almost entirely different game from what we see today. But back then, people loved it. And over a weekend in June of 2011, more than 1.6 million people tuned in to watch Europe's Team Fnatic claim the number one spot, despite only a handful of people showing up to see the event in person. First place in this tournament earned $50,000, second got $25,000, and the rest of the $100,000 prize pool was distributed between the remaining teams. At this time, League of Legends had over 11 million monthly players, and seeing over 10% of that number check in on the World Championships was extremely promising for League as an eSport. Season 1 may not have been the prettiest or most mechanically intense season of all time, but it absolutely showed that people had interest in competitive League and was definitely a sign of things to come. Oh Fnatic going to win the season one championship if they can hold on. This Nexus will go down. Congratulations to Fnatic winning the season one. GG. GG indeed. Season two saw an astonishing increase in both support and competition for League of Legends with Riot Games pledging to pay out $5 million over the course of the year to benefit the growth of the esports scene. Major esports organizations received $2 million, $1 million went to independent tournament organizers for events throughout the year, 
and the final 2 million would become the prize pool for the Season 2 World Championships, the largest payout in the history for esports at the time. Qualifying for Worlds worked the same way as in Season 1 at this time, with teams fighting for dominance at tournaments around the world, although we saw the addition of new regions vying for the top spot beginning in Season 2. The Singapore and Philippines regions had been removed, and now the competition consisted of 12 teams from China, Europe, North America, Taiwan, Southeast Asia, and South Korea, with four teams advancing directly to the knockout stage and the remaining eight being divided into groups to determine which four teams would compete against them. The advent of Korean teams appearing in competitive League of Legends had a huge effect on the future of the eSport, although during Season 2 they were not able to take first. That distinction was earned by the Taipei Assassins, the one team that qualified from Taiwan, who beat Korea's Azubu Frost 3-1 to earn their $1 million prize money. Overall, Season 2 was significantly more competitive than Season 1. The production quality was higher, and Worlds was treated as its own standalone event rather than just a part of a set of events like we saw at Dreamhack for Season 1. The change from being held at Dreamhack to being a standalone event allowed Riot Games to push the World Championships back to October to better align with the end of the ranked season for non-pro players, a change that still stands to this day. Season 2 was also the first incident of live cheating that we saw in Professional League of Legends, with a member of Azubu Frost turning his head to see the massive projections meant for the audience's viewing to gain an advantage, as the spectator mode used during the tournament showed enemy positions and movement. Azubu Frost was fined $30,000, and many viewers believed this deserved as disqualification for Azubu Frost, while others saw it as an oversight on Riot's part and called for isolated booths to be provided for the players of each team to prevent future issues. As a whole, Season 2 was dramatically more successful than Season 1, selling out the Galen Center Basketball Stadium with more than 10,000 in-person viewers, and seeing 1.1 million concurrent viewers online. This can be marked as the first step in League's meteoric rise in esports popularity, and Riot was determined to keep stepping up their game, not only in production value, but in competition as well. August of 2012, just before the Season 2 World Championships, saw the announcement of the formation of the League of Legends Championship Series, or LCS, for players in North America and Europe. Meant to be a professional league with a regular schedule and guaranteed salaries for players, the LCS was a monumental step towards making esports feel closer to regular sports. With weekly games and production on par with the larger tournaments of the time, LCS helped viewers get more excited about League of Legends and jump-started the dream of thousands of people to someday get a chance to play on the big stage. With the introduction of LCS, an expansion of the World Championship came as well, allowing 14 teams to compete rather than just well. The four teams that were the number one seeds from China, Korea, North America, and Taiwan earned direct entry into the quarterfinals, known as the knockout stage, while the remaining teams who qualified through other means would face off in two groups, with the top two teams from each group advancing to fill out the rest of the top eight. This made the World Championship slightly longer, and while it provided more security to the teams that earned their spot as a number one seed, it allowed any other qualifying team the opportunity to compete with the best of the best in League of Legends for a now over a $1.5 million prize pool. Season 3 is viewed by many as the golden age of League of Legends. Team fights lasted longer, allowing for more high impact plays, carries lived longer to do more damage, and the mechanical intensity and skill involved in the game took a huge step up compared to previous years. Season 3 was when we saw the introduction of the team SK Telecom T1 from Korea, and with it came the League of Legends symbol Faker. Faker is one of the most famous League of Legends players of all time, and was a dominant force no matter what his matchup was. His mechanical skill and decision-making abilities helped allow SKT T1 to take the championship with a stunning 3-0 victory over China's Royal Club, despite not coming directly into the quarterfinals and needing to fight their way through the group stage. Season 3's viewership, much like Season 2's, saw a massive jump when compared to the previous year, with 8.5 million concurrent viewers during the finals. Riot had realized this year would be bigger than the last, and were able to secure the Staples Center in Los Angeles for the live venue. 
Despite this venue being nearly double the size of the one for Season 2, tickets still sold out in less than an hour. This again shattered the previous record for esports viewership, and continued to motivate Riot Games to keep improving and putting more effort and money into making League of Legends esports as successful as it could possibly be. SK Telecom are just rolling through. The Nexus turrets are potentially going to go down. This could be a 20 minute game for SK Telecom. They will be the Season 3 World Champions here at the Staples Center. Season 4's regular season ran much the same as Season 3's, with LCS in North America and Europe and LCK in Korea showcasing their teams in weekly face-offs to determine who is the best. Worlds, however, saw yet another shift in the goalposts. Choosing to move away from promoting top seeds directly into the quarterfinals, Season 4 had 16 total teams. Three from North America, three from Europe, three from Korea, three from China, two from Southeast Asia, and then two international wildcards that earned their spots through placements from tournaments at Games Common Packs. These teams were then divided into four groups, with one team from each region in each group, and the eight best performing teams were then moved into the bracket stage, where teams would begin to be eliminated. The group stage and bracket stage took place in separate countries, making Season 4's World Championships the first multi-country League of Legends tournament, which would then become the norm. Ultimately, the teams who moved on and performed best were the Chinese and Korean teams, with two teams from China and two from Korea taking all of the top four spots, and the Korean team, Samsung White, taking first place and one million of the $2.13 million prize pool. While the gameplay itself was relatively consistent when compared to Season 3, Riot Games stepped up their production and involvement in the process, bringing in the band Imagine Dragons to create a song for the Season 4 World Championships called Warriors. These changes on top of the growing player base of League of Legends caused the Season 4 World Championships to have a peak concurrent viewership of 11 million people and filling the Seoul World Cup Stadium with 45,000 live viewers, again breaking the previous esports viewership record. This is also the year that cemented a period of Korean dominance in competitive League of Legends as a whole. They're short here, but they were actually pushing that super minion wave through, and Samsung White are on towards the Nexus turrets. Look at the damage that they have there. The first Nexus turret is going to fall. Only Lulu really there to stop them. The second Nexus turret fall. They're going to focus in on the Nexus itself, and Samsung White are the 2014 World Champions. Shortly after the end of Season 4, Riot Games made sweeping changes to the Summoner's Rift map the game takes place on, with alterations to the graphics, changes to the way some of the monsters on the map interact with players, the addition of the Rift Herald that created a much needed objective on the top side of the map, and the addition and removal of many of the items that were added in Season 4. This led to another scramble to figure out optimal builds and strategies as quickly as possible, and caused shakeups across the LCS and LCK. This was also the year that Riot Games announced its second official international tournament, called the Mid-Season Invitational. This tournament consisted of teams from each major region, and one international wildcard, and is viewed as the second most important League of Legends tournament behind only the World Championships itself. This shakeup was not able to dismantle the Korean dominance over the scene, however, as SKT T1 were able to come out and win their second World Championships in 2015, 3-1. This was around the time that the rest of the world took note of how incredible foreign players were when compared to some of the talent available in their own region, and was when we began to see high-performing import players moving out to other parts of the world. Most notably in Season 5, the European team Fnatic picked up two Korean players, Huni and Rainover, and these two were able to help them cinch the third place spot at Worlds. Similar to the Season 4 championships, Season 5 was another multi-city, multi-country event with matches played in Paris, London, Brussels, and the finals taking place in Berlin. Season 5 was also the first time teams were required to have a coach during their matches who would communicate with the team during the pick and ban phase of the game, making coaches officially recognized members of League of Legends teams. The addition of coaches was another step towards League of Legends acting more as a sport than a video game tournament, and helped many realize that esports are becoming a more serious endeavor with millions of dollars on the line. It's going to be Kuro out safely. Prey, however, has to run away from his base. SK Telecom looking to take down the final Nexus turrets. It does not look good for Kuro and his team. Ku Tigers are falling. SKT will be your first ever two-time world champions!
The Season 6 World Championships saw a return to the United States following a relatively normal regular season, with games played in Chicago, San Francisco, New York City, and the finals being held in Los Angeles. While the location returned to the same areas as they were in Seasons 2 and 3, Riot stepped up and made the prize pool for this year the biggest by far in the history of League of Legends with a total of $6.7 million. With such a large prize pool, teams from all regions were fighting hard to bring home the trophy for this year, with promising displays coming out of Europe's G2 Esports, North America's CLG, China's Edward Gaming, and Korea's Rox Tigers. Korea proved to be the best yet again, however, with three of the four teams taking the top four spots at Worlds being from Korea, and SKT T1 winning their second World Championship in a row. This was an unheard of accomplishment, and all viewers were watching with bated breath to see if the Koreans would be able to achieve such a monumental goal. SKT won first place and the almost $2.7 million prize over Samsung Galaxy 3-2 in front of 14.7 million concurrent viewers. It became more apparent during the season that Koreans were insanely dominant in League of Legends esports, and Worlds was effectively decided by which Korean team played the best. Viewers from outside of Korea began to become frustrated with their own team's performances, and more people began to follow the scene just for the sliver of hope that there was another region with the possibility of winning Worlds once again. Chomps down to kill Crown. SK Telecom have got two, make that three kills. The curtain call is a fitting end to the World Championship as Samsung Galaxy are being dove under their tower. SK Telecom have overcome every challenge. They are the undisputed best team in the world. The SKT reign continues. They win their third World Championship. Season 7 was when we saw a change in the way the epic dragon monsters functioned within the game. Whereas previously, defeating the dragon provided the entire team with gold, Season 7 caused a dragon of a random elemental type to spawn, with each type of dragon providing permanent buffs such as increased damage, improved damage to objectives, more healing, or bonus movement speed. This change added even more additional layers to the game, and required a change in the way teams played and prioritized objectives. Season 7 carried on much in the same way of the preceding years but with the addition of a new form of tournament known as Rift Rivals. Rift Rivals was a series of cross-regional tournaments where related regions would be put up against one another, with North America competing with Europe, China, Korea, and Taiwan facing off, Brazil and the Latin American regions going head-to-head, -head, Japan, Oceania, and Southeast Asia playing one another, and Turkey, Vietnam, and the independent organizations rounding off the final tournament. The teams who placed best in the spring split of each championship series seasons would be sent to these invitational tournaments in July, and served as an early sneak peek into how the best teams would match up against one another prior to Worlds. These tournaments were relatively short-lived, only being around from Season 7 until Season 9, but they built hype for Worlds and really allowed each team to show off their stuff on the world stage before it was time for the official World Championships. In addition, the World Championships organization was changed to allow 24 teams to compete rather than the 16 previously allowed. Beginning in Season 7, there were 3 teams from Korea, 3 from China, 3 from North America, 3 from Europe, 3 from Taiwan, and 1 team each from the new regions in Brazil, North Latin America, South Latin America, Japan, Oceania, Turkey, Southeast Asia, and Russia plus one wildcard qualification that was earned through LCS performance or through the play-in stage, which was an additional tournament prior to the beginning of the group stage previously included. The main event for Season 7 Worlds was dominated by Korean and Chinese teams, with the only non-Asian region to get through the knockout stage being North America's Cloud9, and Europe's teams Fnatic and Misfits. With three Western teams being in the top eight of Worlds though, viewers around the world started to get excited at the possibility of their team going all the way this year. Unfortunately, this proved to not be the case, as the top four ended up being made up of two Korean teams, Samsung Galaxy and SKT T1, and two Chinese teams, Royal Never Give Up and World Elite. Samsung Galaxy and SKT faced off in the finals, and this year, Samsung Galaxy was able to turn the tides and reverse the roles from Season 6, winning Worlds over SKT 3-0. Season 7 earned Korea another Worlds win, but despite the heartbroken viewers in North America and Europe, it still broke records, with millions of concurrent viewers at its peak. The prize pool for Season 7's World Championships was lower than in previous years at just over $4 million, but that doesn't detract from its success. 
The incredible quality of play and performances like the dragon landing on stage during the tournament ceremonies, alongside the hope of millions of fans for their team to take the victory, caused Season 7 to be a favorite tournament for many fans of the game. Everything to kill him! A game winning pick, a championship winning pick for Ruler. That might be the Flash R that signals the end of the SKT dynasty. There are no turrets. It is five versus three. Hooney, do you have what it takes to win the game? Big certainly does not. Ruler on the Nexus. The upset is complete as the kills come through. The SKT dynasty is over. All hail the new kings. Samsung Galaxy. Continuing the same format as the year prior, Season 8 saw the same 24 team competition at the World Championships. But the outcome proved to be significantly different. With both Korean teams being eliminated in the first round of the knockout stage, it became guaranteed that another region will win Worlds for the first time in 5 years, and people were hyped. The top 4 for this year was made up of two European teams in Fnatic and G2, a North American team in Cloud9, and the Chinese team in Victus Gaming and everyone was watching to see what would happen next. The tournament was held in stages across China, and Invictus Gaming was able to defeat Fnatic 3-0 in the finals to secure a win on their home turf, an almost $2.5 million first place prize out of the $6.4 million total prize pool. Despite the fact that it wasn't a North American or European team that won Worlds, this tournament reinvigorated fans and showed everyone that the Koreans were not unstoppable. Morale gained a serious boost, and the viewership reflected just how excited people were to see something other than another instance of two Korean teams facing off in the finals, with a peak viewership of 44 million concurrent viewers. The game had been brought back to the point where the rest of the world felt like they could compete, and all teams began working harder to try and secure a win for themselves in the coming years. Season 8 also saw the inception of the virtual girl group KDA from Riot Games. At the World Championships, KDA was unveiled to the world and performed their first song, Pop Stars. The song quickly went viral and created buzz surrounding both league players and the fans of this K-pop style that KDA was modeled for. This appearance at the opening ceremony showed Riot's first incredibly successful foray into performance and ceremony outside of strictly League of Legends content and stunning visuals, and helped determine the direction their next step would be in their creative freedom. Pressuring onto the turret with the rest of IG. Reckless is down. Brox is away. IG are on the Nexus. The LPL has never won before, but that will change today. The Crownless are finally king. And Invictus Gaming are your 2018 world champion. The year following China's win was a brutal fight to get on top and stay on top in each respective region. The addition of Teamfight Tactics in summer of 2019 also threw a wrench in some teams' plans to fully prepare for the coming competition, as the game became incredibly popular. With each part of the world seeking to have their shot at the next world champion title though, we saw tons of back and forth in the standings between teams around the world. Ultimately, we saw the return of some fan favorites, as well as some relatively unexpected upsets leading into Worlds of 2019. The finals came down to G2 Esports up against Fun Plus Phoenix, G2 defeating SKT and Fun Plus Phoenix taking out Invictus Gaming in the semifinals. For the second year in a row, we saw a World Championship final without a Korean team. And yet again, we saw an absolutely enormous turnout in viewership, with 44 million concurrent viewers at its peak. G2 was the favorite to win in this final showdown, but it didn't quite pan out for them, and ultimately, Fun Plus Phoenix took a quick victory with a 3 0 win, getting China as a region their second World Championship victory in a row. Perks left standing. Fun Plus Phoenix are looking to silence the haters and stun the world with their own style of League of Legends. They are pushing onto the Nexus. The favorites of G2 in Paris did not stand a chance. And Fun Plus, they've taken down the Nexus. They turn their attention to Wonder. Tian goes down. Perks kills Kim Goon. The Nexus is being focused. It's going down. And Fun Plus Phoenix are your world champions. The most recent League of Legends esports series was the Season 10 competition, and while it looked much different than anything before it, it was still the peak of talent in a game played by millions of people around the world. Following Season 9's World Championships, we saw a change in the way the Dragon buffs functioned within the game, with Cloud Drake now providing ultimate cooldown reduction, and Mountain Drake now providing increased resistances rather than extra damage to objectives. 
This, alongside the addition of the Dragon Soul, where the first team to kill four dragons receives an empowered buff based on the type of dragon, caused another change in the way teams prioritize dragon control, and really forced the teams to figure out who is the best at adapting quickly and effectively to changes within the game. The current situation the world is facing prevented players from competing in person at events, but the League of Legends Championship Series games carried on from their homes, and the format for qualification changed so that teams from North America and Europe were only able to qualify directly through the LCS and LEC playoffs respectively. The matches at Worlds were played in Shanghai, and we saw what seemed to be a return to form for the Korean teams that participated in the World Championships. Three Korean teams made it out of the group stage and into the knockout bracket, with Damwon Gaming making an incredible run through the Korean DRX and G2 Esports to make it into the finals where they faced off against China's Suning Gaming, ultimately winning Worlds despite having to play under unforeseen circumstances. We don't have the final numbers for the global viewership or prize pool for this event, but early analysis shows that viewership was just slightly lower than that of the Season 9 World Championships. It's been a three-year hiatus for the LCK, a drought when it comes to finals appearances. And today, Dom One Gaming will shut down Suning. Dom One will silence Shanghai. And Dom One Gaming are your season 2020 world champions. After a decade of competitive League of Legends, we've seen a steady rise in viewership at the top of the top of the game. Starting from a couple hundred thousand viewers watching games at DreamHack and becoming a cultural spectacle viewed by millions between the filled stadiums and those watching from the comfort of their homes. With frequent changes from Riot Games for balance purposes and adjusting the way the game is played to make matches more enticing for viewers, League of Legends has become a game not only of mechanical skill and strategy, but one of adaptation. Each time large changes were added to the game, professional players needed to work together with their teams to suss out what the optimal strategies were, sometimes multiple times per season, to reinforce their place as the best in the world at what has become a monumentally popular esport. Competitive League of Legends has become an esport that rivals the popularity of the biggest sporting events around the world, and the work that Riot Games has put forward to continuously improve not only the competition itself, but also the viewer experience, is undoubtedly one of the causes for why League of Legends is where it is today. The production value has increased exponentially from where League started, and the opening ceremonies at Worlds, commentary provided by the biggest names in esports, and highest of the high level play has created something even people who don't play video games can appreciate. From heartbreaking upsets, to dominant organizations, to the nail biters that go right down to the last hit of the game, League of Legends is a beautiful game and there's no doubt that its success will continue for many more years to come.